All right. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to throw those in the chat. If you'd like to introduce yourself in the chat as well, uh, parents sometimes introduce the age of the child that they support, the age of their own student, um, or if there's a particular question that's top of mind for you coming into the conversation this evening, you're welcome to throw that into the chat as well. All right. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we are supporting we're, this evening, we're supporting a class on how to notice and support grief and loss in your adolescence and how to support teens as they navigate those feelings. And we're joined today um, by a couple of members of the Palm Springs team. Mary is providing interpretation for us. And we also are joined by Monica Nyland, who will be representing the Family Engagement Center and sharing more information about the resources that are available to you as community members in Palm Springs. And then we're also joined by Wendy Youngsmith, who we'll introduce in just a minute. Wendy is one of the amazing clinicians with Daybreak Health and works directly with teens who are supporting and processing um, grief and loss at this point in time. And she's a real expert in this material. So we're excited to hear from her. Before we dive in, um, Mary, do you want to ask about interpretation before we move forward? Buenas noches a padres de familia. Si desean interpretación, les mandé un mensaje directo. Me pueden contestar. En el momento que desean interpretación, les mando yo la indicación de cómo conectarse al canal de español. Gracias. All right, thank you. Okay, so before we dive into the real meat of our conversation, Wendy and I thought it would be helpful to also introduce a little bit about who we are as an organization supporting Palm Springs Unified. So we represent Daybreak Health. We're an online counseling platform supporting teens ages 11 to 19, and we work with districts and pediatric groups all across California. Our team is made up of clinicians like Wendy, um, who are really focused on supporting youth and really skilled in that particular area. We're serving students that are facing a number of primary symptoms, and those might include anxiety, depression. Um, we're supporting teens that have experienced bullying or traumatic events. Um, and today, our conversation will be focused on supporting teens specifically experiencing and processing grief and loss. Um, we are partnering with Palm Springs to also provide these counseling services directly to secondary students. And so if you have a child that you would like to um, connect with Daybreak Health for one-on-one -on -one counseling services in that secondary age group, you're welcome to share that with your school site counselor and they can help refer your child to our services as well. And then of course, I know I mentioned that we're working therapeutically with teens ages 11 to 19, but a lot of the content that Wendy will be sharing today is also very relevant and applicable for younger kiddos as well. Um, so if you have elementary age students, that's totally fine. Um, and we welcome you in this conversation today. All right, and then last housekeeping item, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to throw those in the Q&A box and we'll be monitoring that throughout the conversation this evening. We're actually gonna hold some time as well at the end for Wendy to respond to your questions and really engage in a discussion uh, with families that are present this evening. Um, but if it feels appropriate to respond to your question in the moment, we can also type responses into the chat box. Alrighty, um, and our agenda for this evening. So as I mentioned, our conversation today is really focused on understanding grief and loss, defining that for ourselves so we have a shared definition, really diving into what that looks like in teens and in young adults, how current events are impacting um, teen understanding right now of grief and loss and how that is impacting their own ability to process through that, how it's, it's maybe prompting grief and loss. Um, and we'll also share what this looks like in families and in family dynamics and interpersonal relationships. And then we'll spend quite a bit of time on how you as family members and as adults in these young adults' lives can help and support. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to our amazing clinician, Wendy. Um, Wendy, before you introduce us to this topic area and our learning objectives, we'd love to learn a little bit about your background and what brings you into this work. Diana, uh, she always, 
builds me up really high. I hope to live to up to expectations. Um, so I really, for the entirety of my therapeutic career, have really been focused on adolescents and their families. They're my people. They have always been my people. It is this amazing period of time where there's a lot of growth and transition, sometimes crazy making growth and transition. Um, and I just, I really love getting to help our youth know themselves better, helping families um, to understand this time period. Um, and tonight I got to help a little bit with understanding just a slice of that um, in regards to grief and loss. If I'm doing my job correctly tonight, um, you will come away understanding what grief and loss are and the stages of grief, have an introductory understanding of what grieving looks like inside, right, so the emotions, and outside, which are some expressions and behaviors of a teen that's experiencing grief, um, an understanding of two or more communication or presence tools to support your youth in grief, and to have two or more ideas for some practical rituals or tools that you can use at home or use those things as an inspiration for your own ideas. Um, while I have some ideas, you guys are really experts in your own world. So if I can plant a seed and you can make that your own, that's also great. Uh, so as we're getting started, acknowledging that grief and loss can be a challenging topic and that you're all here because you want to help in some way. This um, is really based on that helping space. So what is something that you found comforting after a loss? Um, please feel free to type that in a chat. I'm gonna reference some of this later. Uh, while we're doing this through a school, this is also not a class. You're not being graded on your responses. Your participation really is um, at your comfort level. Um, but I would love to hear some of the things that you all have found comforting after experiencing a loss. So I got speaking about it. Sorry, I'm gonna click in here so I can see these better. Reflecting. Photos, I like that. Okay. Just a second for any last responses that might be coming in. I know sometimes people are having to text from phones and that always takes a bit of extra time. We have a couple of great reflections that came in. Um, I, it looks like these comments are coming to the hosts and the panelists. So I'll read them for those that may not be able to see them. Um, one of our, our attendees shared speaking about it and keeping her memory alive. Another shared spending more time with family, talking with others, talking about my loved ones, even though it's painful. Thank you all for sharing those. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Like I said, this, we will come back to this. So I'm not just asking you to reflect for reflection's sake. All right. So what are grief and loss? So loss is the act or experience of losing a person or a thing of importance. And then grief is that mental or emotional suffering or distress that's caused by that loss. This third one, and I'm going to reference this with current events, so we'll come back to this too, but an ambiguous loss is a loss that's less clear, right? So the physical presence of something or someone, but that the emotional presence is missing, or the reverse, the physical loss of something without a firm goodbye or ending. Ways to think about this more concretely that help with understanding is like if you have an elderly parent that is experiencing dementia or Alzheimer's, right, that person is still there, but pieces of them start to disappear. Or um, this also was used initially when we're talking about um, missing people. So not really knowing if that person 
is alive or not and not being able to have some of that closure. So ambiguous loss actually applies to a lot of what's been in our world um, in the next couple of years. And so we'll return to that as well as we get further in the presentation. All right, so this comes from Kubler-Ross. These are stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. When we use the term acceptance, that doesn't mean that you stop feeling something about that loss. It simply means that you've been able to understand how it fits into your life, into the scope of your life, and how you can place that in a way that feels okay. All right, so stages is really a misnomer. It's not really a stage. It is not point A to point B. It's really more experiences of grief. Um, this is particularly true for our youth. So they are for sure going to be in that squiggly line of grief that are, is gonna encompass all of those things at any given point. Um, how do all of these things show up really? So you're talking about multiple emotions either happening simultaneously or rapidly fluctuating, sometimes getting stuck in them, but that ultimately this comes out at people is often an irritation or annoyance. That's typically a reflection of I'm holding too much. I can't take one more thing that what's happening and now I'm gonna snap at you. And so that comes to making the people close to them a target. Congratulations caregivers here. This is probably going to be you. Um, so teens might seem kind of mean as they're experiencing some of these grief and loss moments. Emotional fluctuations, it is a piece that um, is really a hallmark of adolescent years anyway. So it is going to make that bigger. For youth that tend to already be quieter, you're gonna see them withdraw more. Right? These are youth that might shut themselves away in their room more often, or if they used to be bubbly and talkative, maybe you're getting much more surface responses or replies. They're just not quite connecting in the way that they used to. Probably means they're really stuck in their head. Um, overwhelm is a big part of this, right? Not being able to identify what they're feeling, just knowing that they're feeling too much. So some of this is um, whatever tendencies your youth has, this is going to make those bigger. And again, this shows up really differently for different kids. Um, I'll give two examples of youth that I'm working with. So one of them recently had a friend die unexpectedly. And in the space of a single hour session, went through every single stage of grief. Right, at one point, super angry. Um, not only at the world, but at themselves, right? Then went into a bargaining space of I could have, I should have done something different. It was also then tearful and just so sad. Um, couldn't believe it was true. Well, maybe didn't get to all the stages. There wasn't quite an acceptance space in that, which is normal, um, but went through all of those emotions. And then of course landed in an overwhelmed space of I'm just feeling so much. Um, and really in those moments, what you can do is be present for that and be a holding space and acknowledge that, yeah, this comes with a lot of feelings. One of my other youth, by the time that he came to me was really stuck in depression. He had um, weathered the transition between eighth grade and ninth grade during school closures. And he had been in a K through eight school so these were people that he had known his entire life and then transitioned to a high school where he didn't know anybody and was no longer familiar with the environment and was deep in a sense of loss about that that was really showing up in heavy depression and an inability to engage in much at all. Um, it took about six months to even get him to move into an anger or frustration space. So sometimes you can really get 
stuck in one of these phases as well. There's a huge range, all of it's normal. Um, so just know that this, uh, you're gonna have to know a little bit about your youth to know which tendency they might have more of in this picture. Which brings us to then current events. So this is Dr. Robert Neimeyer. Again, apologies to him in the universe if I'm mispronouncing his name. Um, the pandemic has compounded grief and loss, which include our sense of predictability, control, justice, and the belief that we can protect our children or elderly loved ones. So again, this last couple of years brought many different kinds of losses. So a concrete loss really is something that is like identifiable, um, like a person or a thing, right? So some of these concrete losses that happen, right, was missed school events or transitions, right? For some people that, you know, was a prom or a graduation from, you know, eighth grade even or from high school, um, different ways to honor passages of time that also included family events or holidays or traditions that would typically mark a year having disappeared. And again, because this was an illness related closure of all these things, we did have youth that had family members die. And so there are compounding concrete losses that occurred in the last couple of years. All right, so coming back to that ambiguous loss space. So really what this is, is a loss of predictability and a typical life flow, right? So things didn't disappear, but they got really different. Um, and for youth, that often means, I don't know what's going to happen. What does this mean to be on shakier ground, right? So what can I predict? What is going to stay the same and what will continue to change? What do I do with time that doesn't feel quite normal or being in a place in my life that I might not be ready for? Right. So I hear, especially at the beginning of this school year from my juniors, but wait, I left when I was a freshman. How am I already an upperclassman? Right, so that loss of time sometimes is like, wait, what happened, right? Um, I know these people, but maybe not their whole faces, right? We've been masked for quite a bit of time. And before that we were on Zoom and teens on Zoom are like this a lot, right? So they haven't had the opportunity of a whole person in front of them. I know this place, school, but my routines are a little different. Right, so we went from closures to like part-time school. Even the transition back to, to normal school or typical school felt like a lot because it hadn't been there for a while. So lots of transitions. And then there's loss of social time and development and lots of loss of skills progression. So when we were all removed from one another, that really interrupted what we would consider to be a, a typical life flow of a youth and the things that they might pick up, especially from social interactions or how they might be learning from one another. Um, one of my clinician supervisees brought in a case because uh, the youth was 12 and she was struggling with some things and it felt not quite right to the clinician, like trying to wrap her head around it. And I asked her to pause and said, if you think about this person as 10, instead of 12, does that make more sense, right? So there's really often a couple years gap between like a chronological age of our youth and really um, an emotional age of some of our youth. That in and of itself can feel like a weird loss, right? Our 10th graders might be looking more like eighth graders, but they're like, but I'm in high school. I should know this stuff already, right? So all these things that created some confusion and I don't really know how to think about that. That's what falls under these ambiguous loss spaces, which sometimes can be more challenging to work through. Here, these are just collections of quotes that I pulled 
from some of my notes about what my teens have been saying in this experience. It's all too much. It's like I'm not attached to reality, like with time or myself. I feel crazy, like I'm losing my mind. I'm just being mean all the time. I really don't like that, but it feels like I can't stop it. I can't focus on anything. I have all these thoughts and like they'll start in one place and then land somewhere totally else. And by the time I know what I'm doing, I've lost a chunk of time. I don't know what's going on. I mean, I'm sad, but I don't feel like I have a right to be. It's not like someone died or anything. It's just school stuff. So some of this is along with grief, loss, unpredictability and transition. Often they're judging themselves for the way that they're feeling about it. All right, this is why we're all here, right? It's to try and be these supportive adults. Um, so granted, this research really is based on what was more typically losses in a youth life like divorce or death of a parent or death of a family member, but it really is applicable to our circumstances, right? So research shows that it's not a loss that determines how well a teen does and really any youth does of any age, but the support that they have in the aftermath or midst of that change and grieving it. So thank you all for being here. You are helping to be these people for your youth. So, what do we do? How do we show up as these supportive adults? Um, so part one of this is day to day. Know your own losses and make space for your own grieving so that you can model this to your youth, right? We all existed in these last couple of years together. Some of these losses aren't just these youth losses. Some of them are probably yours. Um, there are things that maybe you missed out on as a parent Maybe there was job disruption. Maybe you, there was a family member that you all lost together, right? So we were talking about like loss of like family traditions or gatherings. Um, maybe the patterns of your life got thrown off. It is okay for you to be feeling things about that. You are human too, even though you are a parent and caregiver. Um, and so being able to know what your own losses are in this process, um, and communicating some of those things, right? So when we talk about creating spaces for open communication without judgment, some of that is allowing for your youth to come to you and express all those things like they were saying in those quotes um, without necessarily you needing to leap to or fix or moving to a, well, we just gotta get past this. Sometimes it's listening and acknowledging that it's tough. Some of that might be creating a connected moment where you share what's been tough for you and perhaps how you're working through it. Um, ride through the emotional fluctuations, right? This is true of parents and adolescents anyway, but especially in this case, if you can help them name the emotion and why they're feeling it, that's enormous, right? So that overwhelm space of I'm just feeling so much and I don't really understand all of that. You being able to notice some of the things like, hey, I'm noticing you're a little annoyed with everything today. My guess is you've got too much going on. What's going on for you? Right? Again, they may or may not always react to that in the nice way. If they're still in high annoying space, they're maybe slamming doors and coming back to it later. Um, but being able to help open that conversation, just that you're noticing that they're struggling and being curious with them will help. This last piece is especially important. Right? Our world continues to shift and change. The more stability and predictability you can create at home, right? Maybe this is, again, you have movie nights, or maybe you have pancakes on the weekend. Um, maybe there are shows you watch together. Uh, maybe it's dinner time or foods that are comforting, right? So keeping the things that have been there as a family in your world and your structures at home can create a really reliable, predictable space when everything else feels like it might be shifting. 
So that is one of the most important things that you can do is continue to be predictable in who you are, how you respond and what you do together at home. Um, all right, so this is gonna apply to some other things coming later. Um, if you can, please tell me about some of your family traditions. This could be around honoring, um, honoring a loss, but this could also be um, things that you do at home together. It could be around birthdays, weddings, graduations, right? Any kind of tradition that you might have, feel free to throw that in the chat. All right, I'm getting, making our favorite dishes. So I got food oriented stuff. Pancakes and cartoons, I like it. It's amazing how much food is involved in traditions. Amazing. Church. Any other Getting together on holidays and eating, yes, food, always food. <laughs> Running walks on holidays, I like it. Okay, all right. Last call for any other comments. Board games, board games are great. All right, so um, just like part one, this is part two. This is where some of those things that you found comforting in your own losses, as well as some of these family transit uh, traditions become important in how you are framing some of these things for yourself, right? So. The first piece was really that day-to-day -day speech and some of that was communication, right? So I know that talking about loved ones or recalling positive memories was one of those comforting things, right? So that's really like that part one piece with communication, being open about speaking about what's happening. Some of these other pieces, right, have more to do with traditions, rituals, tools, right? So human beings really, from the dawn of human civilization, we really like to mark events, transitions, deaths, right? This is why you can find these ancient burial sites or cave paintings and everything else. Um, it's why there's uh, traditions in song um, and celebrations. So this is really a key piece of who we are as humans, really across all cultures in different ways. So when we've had losses and not been able to have kind of the typical markers around those, it becomes really important to be creative about how you are marking some of these things, right? So things that you might try, create a place or a space to remember someone or something. And so maybe that's a garden, Maybe that's a few like cute little succulents in your house that you, you know, create. It doesn't have to be a big space, right? Could be a picture, right? So again, I know that comforting space. And we said looking at pictures, looking at photos and really reflecting on that. Maybe it's a memory book that's not just photos, but including other things, right? Something that's tangible that you have to hold. Um, it could be setting aside time and deciding to hold your own rituals when traditions aren't possible or don't quite fit, right? So this could be releasing balloons or luminaries, maybe putting on a song that was reflective. Maybe that person had a favorite board game or a favorite food that you want to cook or play and do that together to remember that person. Um, or again, maybe there's a thing that you always do for graduations or what might have been the end of a sports season or something else, right, that you can do that. 
taking time to maybe read memories, right? Setting aside some dedicated time to do these things. Creative expression can be really powerful. This is also true of like much younger children who don't um, process things verbally all the time. Creative expression is awesome. This like the art, could be writing, could be dance. Um, some of this is knowing your youth, right? So I will, I'm a terrible visual artist. I would get frustrated and I would have a drawing that would just frustrate me and not be honoring or pleasant for anybody to look at, including myself. Um, but I do like writing. So it would be something more like I would, you know, write a memory or a poem or a couple of words and maybe do something with that writing. So this is where you really get to cater this to your youth and to your family. So these are just some ideas. They're certainly not exhaustive to all the ideas that you can have. Um, right, a lot of these other um, traditions that got mentioned that were really beautiful also fall into that like part one space, which is keeping those consistent things that you guys do together regularly. Um, and that's important too, right? Acknowledging that some of teens reflection is time has gotten wonky, what's happening, right? So if they can mark every Saturday by a pancake breakfast or church by Sundays and we're going together and this feels great, then you've helped create sort of a sense of time and flow for them too. All right, so despite fantastic intentions and doing all of these things to be present for your youth, sometimes the youth might be struggling more than what you might be able to hold. And that is okay. That does not mean that you haven't been present or are doing enough. So here are things to consider if your youth might need some extra support. Um, so maybe they're trapped in a stage of grief, right? Like my youth that I mentioned before, who is really stuck in depression and it's negatively impacting their life at home or at school, right? So in this case, not engaging in anything, not capable of doing work, not being able to show up on screen. So for the extent of like the impairment that it's brought is pretty big. If the fluctuations have created struggles in building peer networks or created interruptions in developing social skills, um, youth don't always listen to their parents about friends. <laughs> for better or worse, um, we're, you know, I'm, I'm a parent myself. I have teens that will listen to me, but I promise you my kids probably won't because I will be old and uncool and like, you know, I wouldn't get it. So um, sometimes with these social skill pieces and developing that, that can be a really tough space for parents to crack into. Um, and that might be something to consider getting some extra added support. And at this point, I'm going to pass it to Palm Springs because, well, I know a lot about grief and loss. I am not an expert on your district. Thank you so much, Wendy. That was a great presentation, I'll say. Um, but I would like to speak briefly about what we can offer. Uh, first of all, I work with the Family Center for Palm Springs Unified, and that is the first listing there, the Family Engagement Center. We have two offices that are here to serve you. One office is in Palm Springs, and the other is in Desert Hot Springs, and we are more than happy to answer any questions. As far as the services that we can offer you, um, Wendy was talking about different activities you can do with your family um, that would help support uh, traditions. We do have, uh, for example, we offer uh, for elementary school age kids, every Wednesday we do a Zoom family fun activity, they call it. And it involves crafts, it involves activities, sometimes it's a game, but every Wednesday we, we ask uh, families to join us. Uh, Wednesdays at the, in this district are minimum days. And so in the afternoon, two o'clock, you're able to join us with the activities uh, that we have planned. Um, and it's just a fun time that you can spend together with your family. We also have different events that we have. Uh, for example, we have in April, we have a STEM conference that we do for the entire district. And it involves a, a lot of really fun activities that teachers put together. And we prepare all the materials. We provide lunch. We provide breakfast. Uh, we just ask families to come and join us. Um, and also we are a great starting point for families. If you are not 
familiar with our um, district or you have questions maybe about, well, who do I speak to about this? Or I have a question about my child's grades or I don't know how to log into parent view, which is what the district uses. Uh, we are a great starting point so that you can let us know and we will find the answer for you. I always tell parents, I may not know the answer, but I will find it for you. And so I do recommend that if you are interested in family activities, uh, give us a call. That, that is our website that is listed there. I will also in the chat put in our phone number that you can reach us at directly. And uh, we're here to help. We can help in both languages, Spanish and English. Um, and if there's a language that we don't offer, we'll find it for you as well. So we do want to be able to offer that to families. Um, I will briefly speak about the mental health department. Um, I, it is not my department, I'll say that starting off, uh, but I, I am familiar somewhat with the services they offer. Uh, but first of all, you can definitely reach their website there. Uh, there are different programs depending on the age of the child, the grade of the child, the services that the child needs or that the family needs. And so the, the best way to get in touch with them, I will put the phone number in here as well. Uh, but uh, you can, if you don't know how to begin, you are more than welcome to give them a call and they will walk you through the process. They actually on that website that is listed, they have a referral page. So as a parent, you are able to refer your child if there's something that is going on that you're not sure about how to handle it feel free to, to fill out that form and they will contact you as soon as possible and they will be able to give you exactly the information that, that your family needs. Not every family needs the same kind of services. And so they do offer different programs um, as far as what the need is for the family. Uh, but again, we are very, very excited to be able to provide these workshops for families. Um, and we're hoping that more parents can take advantage of the next ones that we have coming up. But thank you. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Thank you so much, Monica. And I, I see that Gloria also asked, um, where in Desert Hot Springs is the Family Center? Ah, in Desert Hot Springs, um, we are located on West Street, which is one 1625 is our address, West Drive. It used to be an elementary school called Edward Wensloff Elementary School. It is now called the Edward Wensloff Education Center as it does have different programs. Uh, mental health has an office there in that building as well. And we're uh, right off of Pearson, uh, next to the old library, the small library before they built the new bigger library, I call it. Uh, but we are there to serve you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you. For some of the time that we have remaining this evening, we'd love to open up um, an opportunity for parents to share questions that are top of mind for you after you listen to Wendy's presentation this evening, knowing that every family is very unique and, and there may be something that you're navigating right now that we haven't discussed yet. Um, or there may be a topic area that you'd like to learn a little bit more about. Um, so, to get started, we do have a couple of questions already in the Q&A box. So we'll respond to those first. And then if you have other questions you'd like to add, please throw those in and we'll respond to the questions in order. Um, so the first question, Wendy, this is a great question for you um, from Gabby. How do you think about supporting other loved ones who are grieving while also dealing with your own grief? Um. So this comes back to really that first point about right knowing your own grief and loss. Um, some of that might be knowing if that's getting too close for you um, or that's going to make you both really more emotionally overwhelmed and flooded. Sometimes it's just being present with one another if you're not able to navigate it together, right? So sometimes Frankly, in these moments, especially with families, you're kind of lost in the grief soup together. Um, and it's all right to be mutually messy as long as you continue to be present for one another and you know that you're going to show up for one another. 
sometimes the secondary challenge of that is that because human beings deal with grief differently, right? There was a whole big different list about how people might be navigating this. It's also, um, if your style of grief is really different from your loved one's style of grief, that's going to be challenging, right? So if this is, let's say you have more of a tendency to withdraw and they really more want to be in your business, sometimes those styles are mismatched. And so some of that is owning each other's styles and being able to talk about what you might need from each other in that. Um, but like a lot of things know that, especially if it's mutual, whenever you're supporting someone in their grief, you're also going to be feeling things about that. Um, so if you are really sh wanting specifically to show up for that other person and not necessarily be in fully your own process space, know that after that, you're going to have to set aside time for yourself to let out whatever came up from those conversations. Um, this can also really be true for parents, right? If you have a child that is hurting so much about something, you're going to hurt with them because that's your child. Um, and in that moment, that part of it isn't theirs to carry, right? You can notice that it's hard for them. You can show up for them. You can be present for them. And then after walking away from that conversation, you're going to be like, oh, my poor child. Like, I'm hurting for them. And maybe have a trusted adult or somebody else you know that can help through that sort of secondary piece. Um, did that cover that? quite enough. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. yeah. No, I thought that was wonderful, Wendy. Um, thank you so much for speaking to that. And Gabby, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to throw those in the Q&A box as well. Um, I'm going to jump to Viviana's question, um, which she shared with our panelists. How do I know it's time to seek counseling for my child? He lost his sister five years ago, and the whole COVID out of school thing has made him a child who stresses about school easily and specifically school tests and all. Um, what we do now is talk about things and how we feel. Is that enough? Um, I will do my best to speak about this broadly, knowing that I, I, don't, I don't know him deeply yet um, or at all. Um, I don't know if I will ever get the opportunity for that, but... Um, if you're feeling like it's starting to cause a lot of other disruptions and that the feelings discussion doesn't feel like enough um, and you might need extra tools that you might not be equipped to provide that would be a space to consider counseling of some kind. Um, I hope that you all again are sort of experts on your children and knowing them really well um, and having spent a life, their lifetime with them um, and listening to their emotions and being present for them. I don't expect that as parents and caregivers that you're going to know all of, you know, the spectrum of like therapeutic tools to be telling your youth to try. Um, so, you know, if there's stuff that he's trying to work through, but feeling like he's getting stuck or he's in that like high anxious space, but doesn't quite know what to do with it. I love that he's able to express it to you. I love that he's able to be open about it with you. Um, and it may be outside of your role with like the, well, what do I do with that then um, to move through it? that might be a space to consider um, having a counselor or a therapist come on. And maybe that's not even long-term, that might just be shorter terms and skills development. And again, knowing that you're also a really supportive caregiver that might be like, hey, these are some of the tools that we're working on. Here's how you can help support him. Here's what he's using. Here's how you can remind him of that. Um, it's sort of hard for me to tell exactly what tool might be right for him because it is a bit of an experimentation process to find that, especially in the anxiety cases. Um, but my guess is that there are things that if he puts them to use would help with some of that um, space. Oh, 
sorry, I'm trying, trying to read in too many different channels here. I'm sorry, I'm getting lost in my own technology. Thanks, Vivian. Thank you, Wendy. And thank you so much for sharing that, that question um, with the group. It's really, I appreciate you sharing that with us and, and we can have this discussion. Um, I have another question in the Q&A box. It's really hard to talk about this. Can you give us some ideas for opening questions and ways that we can begin the conversation or open up the conversation about grief and loss? Okay. Um. And so again, some of this is, is dependent, right? If, um, Gabby, I'm also remembering you were the person that was doing like board games or food or dinners and things like that as part of the traditions. Those are often good places to start um, in terms of conversation openers. If there's a game that um, you happened to play with the person that you lost, um, or if there is a particular meal that was really their favorite, sometimes that's a space to open up conversation. Sometimes it's a day-to-day -day thing, um, maybe just admitting like, hey, when I was doing this today, I thought about this person. Um, because there are gonna be things that remind you of that person and where you see them. And maybe that's, I'm really feeling that loss deeply. It made me so sad. Or um, could be asking somebody else like when that person comes up for them. Um, so sometimes it's noticing what, what you're feeling and being able to lead with expressing that. Um, that can also help with youth, like if an adult is leading with expressing some of these things it can then opens up that door for communication like oh it's okay to talk about this because my caregiver did um so know that there's a lot of power in simply sharing an experience that you had in opening up the space for that communication um it's probably never going to feel easy these aren't the easy conversations, at least not initially, especially if the loss is fresh. Um, as time goes on, or you've been able to move through it more often, the memories or conversations, again, where you hit sort of that acceptance space where it, you now have a better understanding of how it fits, um, turn into sort of those, you know, more, maybe more bittersweet or funny recollections that you're having more of the positive emotions about it rather than being stuck in the lost space. So, um, and I hope those conversations continue, right? I don't want us to forget the people or the things that we might have lost. I want us to be able to reflect on those. It's just sort of the emotional intensity of it that starts to shift. Um, yeah, so that's maybe where I would start. Um, and again, it might be around an activity together. You're like, hey, I really feel like looking back at pictures from a particular time. Can you sit and do that with me? Um, welcoming people into that space um, and seeing what comes up maybe from looking at something like that or doing something. We're taking a walk together. Um, often when your body is moving, your mind is able to have more clarity also, when you're walking next to somebody, you don't have to make eye contact. It might feel a little less intense. This is also why car conversations are really good for teenagers if they're not in a danger space, obviously. But um, sometimes presence without needing the intensity of eye contact can help too. So if that's still feeling like too much um, or it's too tough to start while you know sitting across from somebody, it's okay to maybe think about doing it in parallel. Thank you, Wendy. And I see another question. Have you worked with teen students with special needs? Um, yes, uh, although special needs is a very broad term. So I, I don't know if there's a particular special need that you were wanting me to address in this particular case. Um, if you're comfortable, would you mind offering a little bit of clarification for me? Let 
maybe I'll just answer that one broadly and if more information. Oh, mm -hmm. health issues and ADHD. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so with ADHD youth in particular, um, they move fast, right? Their thoughts move fast, their emotions move fast. They're just fast paced people. Um, so when we talk about emotional fluctuations, that's gonna be particularly evident in, in that population. Um, in some sense, ADHD also has a superpower where um, you can almost move through challenging things because the time frame of memory is shorter. So I, I don't know um, if it's either heading towards like a fixation space, which can also be a part of ADHD where you get really focused and centered on a particular thing, or if he seems like he's moved through it really rapidly or he's moving in and out of it really rapidly, but that's really the two ways that that typically shows up in ADHD youth um, is either there's gonna be this um, high intensity fixation on it, or there's going to be a really quick ebb and flow in and out of it. And there may be times that they seem totally fine, like they're completely past it. And then all of a sudden they'll be back in it. Um, with physical constraints, um, that can, de depending on the context, and I'm just really throwing this out there. I don't, I don't know when physical issues started. If there's something that they've lived with forever, that's um, often a thing that a kid normalizes a, as a piece of an existence. If that with something that came later on, sometimes those physical health spaces are their own loss spaces. Um, health and mobility and being able to do things and then suddenly not having that is its own loss space. So if that is an element of their experience, like with health um, and needing to grieve certain things that might have been normal that aren't now, a lot of that loss space will apply to that. Um, and that acceptance space often is then more figuring out how we're going to integrate that into our lives and, you know, kind of make sense of that or what becomes the new norm. Um, so, uh, and did that answer any of your questions? Um, is there a different kind of a, a specific question that you had? I know that was sort of a broader answer. I appreciate all of you and your thoughtful questions. It helps me be more targeted to what you all need because I know sometimes this is all very kind of like introductory. Um, so I'm happy, happy to help. We have a few more minutes this evening so we can continue to accept questions that you might have if you'd like to add them to the chat or the Q&A box. I'll also just add that in, in addition to the resources that Monica walked us through that are available in the Palm Springs community, we also know that it can be really helpful to connect directly with your child's school counselor if you are interested in seeking additional support for your child, if you'd like to connect them with a counselor or with a therapist um, like Wendy so that they have you know, some more adult support in navigating their emotions and their feelings and the symptoms they're experiencing. Um, so just a, a reminder that that is an incredible resource available um, to you at, at all sites in Palm Springs. Uh, may I just add, um, I accidentally put the wrong phone number for mental health. Uh, so I went ahead and corrected that. I do apologize. I didn't even notice. Thanks, Mary, for catching me on that one. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Monica. That's helpful. All right, we can hang out for a few more minutes. Um, so if any questions come up, we would be happy to you know, answer and, and hear those questions. So 
we'll just hang out for a few more minutes. We'll be available if anything comes up. I should also just say a huge thank you to everybody for joining us this evening. I know it's a busy weeknight evening and you taking time to join this conversation is um, really meaningful for all of us. And we're really honored to be presenting to the Palm Springs community today. So thank you again for your time. And Monica mentioned that we have a few other classes coming up soon. So stay tuned and we'll have some flyers and registration materials available shortly about some of those upcoming classes. The next one will be in April and then we'll have another class in May. So we'll keep you posted on what those are. Um, and for those of you that registered for tonight's webinar, you can also expect to receive an email with a recording of the webinar and it will also be available for you on the Palm Springs website um, if you'd like to go back and review any of the material that Wendy shared with us this evening. If you're not completely tired of listening to me speak at this point, I think I'm also doing the April one as well. <laughs> well. Sounds like you've covered so much that we are happy for the night. Um, <laughs> I would like to thank uh, Diana and Wendy for the wonderful information they provided to our families tonight. Thank you, Mary, for the translation that I know that uh, some of the technical terms, I'm sure you're sweating. <laughs> but um, we are looking forward to having you again in April. Uh, families, parents, we do invite you if you have any questions still, please contact us. We want to be here for you. We want to support you and what you need. I always tell families, uh, the district, everybody else is here for your students. We're here for you. We want to support you. Um, so feel free to give us a call. Uh, we do have uh, some parenting classes that will begin in at the end of this month. So if you're interested in taking some parenting classes, uh, let us know. We'll be able to give you that information. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for being here tonight. We look forward to seeing everybody next month. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Monica, Mary, and Wendy. <laughs> Thank you.